my name is Alicia Shapiro and I'm with AINews.com. In today's rapidly evolving landscape of technology, the intersection of artificial intelligence and high performance computing stands at a cornerstone of innovation, promising to redefine the future of digital infrastructure. Today, we have the privilege of speaking with Wes Cummins, the CEO and chairman of Applied Digital, a company that stands at the forefront of this innovation, driving sustainability and efficiency in digital infrastructure development. Wes brings to the table not only a wealth of experience in technology investment, but also a visionary approach to integrating AI, high-performance computing, and blockchain technologies in a manner that's not just future-ready, but also environmentally conscious. Wes, thank you for joining us today to share your insights and visions. Thanks, Alicia. Thanks for taking the time. Oh, yeah. Thank you. So how do you see the integration of high-performance computing and artificial intelligence evolving over the next decade? And what role do you see uh, Applied Digital playing that role? So, you know, high-performance in computing has been something that has happened for, you know, years, decades already. Uh, much smaller, I call it niche applications for high-performance computing. And it was often, you know, built at the national labs, uh, universities, it was very research-driven, uh, also used a lot of GPUs, um, you know, supercomputing right. companies that built these out over time. But high-performance computing is exactly that. It's it's computing-driven versus comms-driven or communications-driven. Gotcha. So gotcha. when we look at the vast majority of the things that we use today and the infrastructure, the digital infrastructure that's been built to service these applications over the past you know, 20 or 30 years, it's really been communications driven. It's been mostly video based and image based. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll think of all the apps that we use that have driven you know, the, this crazy growth uh, over, over the past couple of decades since the arrival of the internet. And it's mostly video driven, right? Uh, with right. things like Netflix, we have things like um, YouTube, uh, now TikTok, you know, Instagram, Facebook, all these things that deliver video to us, uh, and and us just sharing videos constantly with our friends and family and, and coworkers. So the the there was a lot of digital infrastructure built for that. Data centers that were typically in in what we would call cloud regions, uh, places of of high population density so that you had ultra low latency communications between the end user and the and the data center where you were you know hosting these types of video applications uh and now as we move forward you know the the high performance computing has been around like i said for quite a while but now it's really starting to explode with uh, artificial intelligence so with the introduction of chat gpt in uh the right at the end of 2022 and now you're seeing a lot of these applications take off they're much more compute or computationally driven versus communications driven. Um, and so what does that mean? That means that the infrastructure that runs this type of equipment and the actual equipment it runs on versus like a web server, uh, it needs um, a, a significant amount of power. There, there needs to be ultra low latency inside the data center, um, not, not well, historically it's been about outside, like from data center to uh, end user. And so it's different, a very different type of infrastructure that requires really high power. Uh, with with high power uh, comes heat. So you need different cooling, heat dissipation right. uh, that's necessary. And so the compute equipment is a lot different versus you know all the applications we've built in the past. And where I see our company is that we're at the forefront of building out this digital infrastructure. So we've already had a lot of experience, you know, building high power density data centers. And now we've changed into high performance compute slash high power density data centers uh, that we've, we've built one in Jamestown, North Dakota. We're building our second, you know, really flagship, I call it the AI brain data center in Ellendale, North Dakota. And it's, it's a hundred megawatts, single building, hundred megawatts IT load, single building. Um, and this is the type of infrastructure that we're involved in to, to really, you know, participate in this new ecosystem that I expect to, to grow significantly over the, over the coming decade. Right. And I was thinking about that um, when I was reading some articles, because I know they're also looking into nuclear power and everything else to try to power these um, computer systems, because AI right. just takes so much energy. Um, so that that's really interesting. But if you can get the digital infrastructure in place first, then perhaps you don't need those 
high powered situation. So, so you you'll still you'll still need the power. So one of the okay. biggest challenges is, is, that I see in the market, it'll, I think it'll become very, you know, obvious as we go through this year and into next is data center capacity and it's really the power availability. So there's a couple of items, the power availability for the data center and then uh, supply chain for all the equipment that goes into, you know, handling the electricity, the HVAC, you know, the environmental. So there's there's extremely high demand for that in the market right now. And so the supply chain is, is you know, difficult to navigate for sure. But but power, I would say, is probably one of the, the top, if not the top issues, you know, for the next 18, 24, 36 months. Um, and because this is a, a fairly power hungry application, uh, and as, as all compute is and, you know, being able to source power is, is has become a significant problem. Uh, and, yeah. and, you know, when you look at traditional data center regions like uh, the, you know, the ring in Virginia or Santa Clara, they're basically tapped out, right? You, you, you're you looking at five year plus lead times for any significant amount of power. And that's kind of the case for everywhere that's a data center region. Um, and so I'm happy to talk about how we find power, how we've locked up power, uh, but I think that's one of the key components for what we do and how we participate in the in this ecosystem. Yeah, how how do you uh, provide the power for that? Because I would I would think that would be a huge opportunity. Yeah, for so it it is, and we've been doing this you know for three years already. We have a significant amount of power contracted and locked up. You know, we built about 500 megawatts of of uh, Bitcoin uh, focused data centers uh, from you know call it. Uh, September of 21 to September of 23. Um, and so we, we are good at sourcing power. And the way we source power is we look for something I call uh, stranded power. We call stranded power. Mm -hmm. And what is stranded power? Stranded power, you know, this, I think a lot of people think that if there's an electron made anywhere in the US or maybe anywhere in the world, it can be magically transported to be used by, you know, someone anywhere in the US or the world. And that's just not the case. So you need the infrastructure mm -hmm. to move those. And there are certain places, typically with with uh, renewable energy builds, um, it, where there's a lot of power generation and not enough uh, transportation capacity, so transport capacity. Uh, and oftentimes that power will go unused uh, or it'll be sold in the market at you know, negative rates. And so what we've done with the, the three facilities that we built so far is every single one is, is uh, either co-located with or located nearby uh, you know, large wind farms. Ours have all been wind, but it would be oh. the same as solar. Um, and so there's, you know, at our site in Ellendale, North Dakota, a significant amount of wind power. I believe it's it maybe close to two megawatts feeds into the to the substation where we have uh, built our, our data center. And so we we find this stranded power that oftentimes goes to waste, typically made from renewable sources. And so we we move to the to the point of power generation to build our data centers instead of you know, being it somewhere in a in a cloud region like in in Dallas or like I said in the in the other ones that I mentioned before. So that that's really what we how we approach that. And typically, what it results in is you know a lower cost of power, uh, more power availability. And for a lot, not all, but a lot of the AI applications, you know, you don't necessarily need ultra low latency. You don't need to be in the cloud regions. And so it's kind of a new dynamic in the market that that we're able yeah. to, to benefit from. Oh, that's really great. Yeah. Um, you you mentioned the sustainability and the wind. That's that's fascinating to me because uh, it, it seems like such a critical point for you, the digital infrastructure, you know, and um, and that's great that you're building these data centers with the direct access to the renewable energy source. So it, it, it not only is helping AI and high performance computing, but it is impacting the environment positively. So that's just all, that's just great. Yeah. I, that's the, the that's other, amazing. Other, yeah. The other big impact there that we focus on is the the efficiency of the data center. Um, right. and okay. So when you think about data center efficiency, um, there there's two pieces of the efficiency. So you have the the power that runs the compute load. And then you have the remaining power that is needed for cooling and mechanical and these other functions. And so there's a there's a term called the PUE, which if you have a PUE of one, that means 100% of the power is going to the IT load, which is as efficient as you can possibly be. 
uh, a lot of the, the current data center builds, the PUE is in kind of 1.3 to 1.5. Um, that's a kind of a broad range, but in that, that area, we're driving to have our PUE below 1.2. Uh, wow. and in our first build, we're running like 1.17 on the PUE. Uh, but the, you know, we expect that that's really one of the other pieces that we drive toward. And it's, and it's two things much, much more environmentally friendly. Uh, so if you could use renewables and you can drive your efficiency much higher, uh, obviously your carbon load is going to be lighter. And then two, uh, for our customers, that lower PUE means lower cost. And so it's it's also uh, part of the, the cost benefit for the for our customers and their business operation as well. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, what would you say to the companies like OpenAI and NVIDIA and all that that are putting out these super high computing powered AI chips? How, why, do you think that's a waste of time? No, so obviously Nvidia is you know they they are you know far and away the market leader here. Uh, mm -hmm. They you know we we use a lot of Nvidia chips um, and we're a, a, an elite tier CSP with Nvidia, uh, which is CSP's cloud service provider. So Nvidia is the leader here. I think you're going to get a lot of because of what has happened. Just you know the nature of markets. Uh, this market has really taken off. Nvidia was way ahead of the game. Uh, I think they're, you know, are going to remain dominant for a long time, uh, but you're going to see a lot of entrance in the market and they're going to be, you know, AMD has a, a competitive GPU product, Intel has a competitive GPU product. Um, so you're going to see those, but then you're going to see purpose-built silicon, which typically comes in the form of, of ASICs, uh, application-specific integrated circuit. So it's made for one application. Gotcha. And so I think we'll see some of those types of options come into the market, you know, maybe some risk five based processors. There's there, there's going to be a lot of competition that comes into that market because that's that's what happens when markets get really big and grow a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I think there is room for other people to come in, into the market and always for innovation. But right now, you know, in, NVIDIA has done a phenomenal job with their products and you know what, what I'm seeing there with NVIDIA is they're they not only have they done a great job, you know, kind of setting the marketplace with the first the A100 and then the H100 that they introduced last year, but they're accelerating their roadmap. Right, they, they right. used to be the the big upgrades came, you know, every four years or so, and now you're seeing a much more accelerated roadmap uh, from NVIDIA to continue to lead, uh, being the lead innovator in in this market. Um, it'll be a big week. We're going to see a lot next week. Uh, at GTC, uh, you know, right. that's going to be a big event. So we'll see a lot of announcements there as well. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And blockchain technology is another key area for applied digital. How do you see that and AI working together to create new opportunities or solutions within the industries that you serve? So the, the, the big similarity that we see uh, is the infrastructure both on, for both is very high power density. And so I, I mentioned this before, but high power density I, I should explain. So when you when you look in a data center and you've seen, I'm sure, pictures of data centers, and there's there's big cabinets or racks of of servers, right? And so in a single, you know, cabinet or rack of of servers, uh, you know, historically it's about 7.5 kilowatts to power an entire rack in in like yeah. a hyperscale where you're doing web servers. Um, so when you we're we're dealing with like what we're building and we're dealing with the Nvidia's. Uh, equipment specifically, we're building rack densities up to like 120 kilowatts per rack. So wow. it, it delivers a lot more power. That's the high power density portion of this. Blockchain is very similar. And why is blockchain similar? It's because it uses, again, it, it's all compute driven, right? It's not it's not high speed comms driven, it's compute. And when you're doing compute, it requires a, a much higher power uh, input to do compute. And so like, let's, let's talk Bitcoin specifically. So, so Bitcoin is, you know, it's, it's doing a, the, the servers in Bitcoin are doing a lot of calculations to secure and validate transactions on the Bitcoin network. That's what they do. And it's, uh, it's crypto cryptography, excuse me. So mm. it's cryptography. So it's, you know, it's, it's just really, really large math equations. And so you use a lot of compute. So there's this overlap in the type of infrastructure that is, that is needed, like the, the data center style infrastructure that's needed um, and then, you know, outside of that, you know, I, I don't see personally, we're not involved in applications around that. So I don't see a lot of overlap beyond that, but the infrastructure mm -hmm. is not that, that much different. It's, it's pretty similar high power density infrastructure. 
they're looking into the blockchain technology to help prevent the misinformation that's all going out on the thing. So if you, you know, with your company already having that blockchain technology in place, I think it'll even help, it'll, it'll help more industries and things. Yeah. So one, one of those, right. So, so this is the, the talk about, um, validating images specifically right, right? so yeah. images because this is going to become you know it's already a problem it's going to become a bigger problem uh so so validating the authenticity of things is something that the blockchain does very well um and so that could be a part you know that those work hand in hand for validating authenticity because you're going to i mean if you if, if you haven't spent time you can look uh you know, like uh, Mid Journey's text to image, right? Or mm. uh, OpenAI's Dolly Three platform. Though the imagery that's created out of those is pretty amazing, and yeah. you've seen a lot of things that are, you know, videos that are created that are completely AI generated, uh, and you you really can't tell the difference. And so, uh, validating authenticity is one of the things that blockchain does extraordinarily well, and could could definitely integrate into that part of of AI. That's great. Yeah. Um, as AI becomes more integrated into our daily lives, you know, people are concerned about the ethical considerations. And so what role do you believe uh, the infrastructure providers like Applied Digital should play in the role of performing um, ethical AI development? Yeah, I mean, for, for us as a company, you know, we we joined the AI Alliance recently that, you know, it's, it's completely based on, you know, oh, great. ethical um, AI applications. Um, so for us, again, as an infrastructure provider, there's there's a, a line where we can choose who to, to have as customers and not have mm -hmm. as customers. Um, and, and we've made you know some of those choices where we passed on things that we didn't think fit our core values as a company. Mm -hmm. um, but but there's going to be there, there. So there's that aspect of it. Um, you know, the, the bigger ethical part of AI is trying to keep guardrails in place. Right. Uh, so that, it, you know, I, I think the, the big concern always is like when, what happens when it gets smarter than us. Right. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and so, so that that's a little bit beyond our pay grade as the infrastructure provider. Um, but, but we, you know, we'll have our input and be involved as much as possible, but there, you know, there's, there's kind of two, two big differences in kind of ethical AI. There's the things that we're talking about, about watermarking, you know, you get all these deep fakes that go on, you know, uh, uh, you know, sad things like the stuff that was going with uh, with Taylor Swift recently and all oh, these, yeah. these fake nude images. And that's going to be a big issue. So that's one side of it. And that and that we can control pieces by not allowing access to our infrastructure for applications like that to run. Uh, the, the larger question, you know, of, of when, you know, not letting AI get away from us and get smarter and not keep it controlled, that's, again, some, something that we, you know, we can try to be involved in, but it's not really where we sit in the ecosystem. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. And as a leader in a company at the forefront of AI and high computing, uh, performance computing infrastructure, what is your personal vision for the future of AI and how does that apply uh, with uh, Applied Digital's vision? Sure. So so there's there's two pieces to this. There's the what what we are going to do inside of our company. And then there's a kind of what I what I think the you know the world is going to do with AI and kind of where it goes. So for us as an infrastructure provider, the goal is to provide you know highest performance, lowest cost, most efficient infrastructure for you know our clients uh, to use and our customers to use, and that's super important for our business. That's our you know one of the things that we'll have to compete on, and so the lowering you know power consumption, lowering costs, being more efficient, higher uptimes. Uh, that's a real focus inside of our company. And then as I look at, you know, the kind of the AI landscape in general, you know, the, the large language models uh, that, you know, wowed everyone at the start with ChatGPT, those are going to proliferate everywhere, right? You're okay. going to see so many companies, whether you're consumer facing or inside, are going to have an AI chatbot, you know, the, that's yeah. going to be customer service or your help desk inside the company or whatever it might be. That's that's just the starting point. I think you're going to see a lot more of that. Um, the, the, the image video generation, you know, whether it's for entertainment, whether it's for marketing, you know, for, for advertising, there's going to be a huge amount of that that takes off. Uh, and it's already taken off. So that that's mm -hmm. going. Um, and then we've seen co-pilots and I think you're going to see a lot of co-pilots show up. Yeah. So Microsoft 
with their co-pilot, Gemini at Google, right? You're going to get all of these kind of helpers inside of your application that you're already using to make you much more efficient. You know, GitHub was one of the really the first ones out there with co-pilot. And I was reading that the GitHub, the copilot's writing now over 50% of the code for the programmers. And so you're uh -huh. making people much, much more efficient. Mm -hmm. um, but th there's one that I think will start to get talked about a lot more over the next you know, 12 to 24 months, which I think mm -hmm. is a, a massive application for AI. And, and that's humanoids. So I think oh, yeah. humanoids will be a, a really large AI-driven application. So mechanically... You know, for the most part, humanoids are are there from a, a mechanical mm -hmm. perspective. They can, you know, walk, function, do do tasks. Uh, it's been the brain development that has been much, you know, uh, further behind. But with the the compute power that you know companies like Nvidia are bringing to the market and other companies bringing to the market, and the way generative AI is now working. Uh, you know, I, I think you're going to see big advancements in humanoids uh, over, over just a, a very short period of time, you know, and there's yeah. there's a, a few companies that are interesting to watch out there on the humanoid front uh, that are definitely leaders in the field. But the reason it'll be big for, for a company like ours, right, that's, that's providing infrastructure is it's mostly going to be visual training. So video mm -hmm. image based training, which requires, you know, a lot of compute for this. And mm -hmm. so, so I, I do think that's a market that hasn't really taken off yet. Um, but all, all of the pieces of the puzzle are there now. That's and that's, great. Pro that's probably a scary market for people, right? That That's <laughs> kind of one of the scarier ones, but, I, but I think it'll be, a, a you know, it, eventually people will realize that this is a, is a, is a really helpful item to have, but uh, but I do think that's, you know, one of the, the next big applications that we'll see for AI. That's awesome. Yeah. And with your extensive experience in technology investment and company leadership, what advice would you give to aspiring technologists and entrepreneurs looking to make a mark in the AI or high performance computing sectors? It's a it's a fast growing market. Um, you know, it's uh, I we'll, we'll see, you know, typically in, in extremely fast growing markets, you have kind of ebbs and flows. And so you have to be prepared for that. It's not, it's not generally always just, you know, a straight line up, um, but it's, it's probably the most exciting technology revolution that we'll see, you know, in our lifetimes. Um, you know, the internet was exciting. Uh, oh, yeah. There's that, that was, you know, a huge change for everyone. This is that next step function. Um, mm -hmm. And so anyone who's looking to be in the space, I, I think it's got extremely strong long-term prospects. But you have to pick, you know, there's so many places, just like any industry, there's so many places to be. We're, we're, we're focused on infrastructure, um, but the, there's, you know, the kind of, there's the, the, the applications, uh, the, there's a whole software layer in the ecosystem that helps companies develop their applications and train their models and do all of this. So there's, there's a lot of pieces that you can, you can be involved in, uh, in this industry. And, and I think it's, it's one of the greatest opportunities that we'll probably ever see. Oh yeah, for sure. And, and so maybe niche down and and pick pick a niche that would maybe suit their best interests and abilities. So, so one of the biggest. So this is just really more of the change in mm -hmm. the way technology works. So, um, you know, the, the, a lot of the companies that we work with that have products that are in market that have millions and millions of users you you would think that they have a large employee base because historically if you're doing because mm -hmm. people think a lot of ai is you know software 3.0 and so what do you do with software you get a lot of coders right and then you make the right. software and they you know work on improving the software and you make a product um but but here you can make these products and kind of make the software with much much fewer people and mm -hmm. so uh, you know some of the companies we work with like i said have millions of not tens of millions of users on their on their application and they'll have 10 to 20 employees inside the company you know it's mm -hmm. it's uh it's really interesting and if you learn how to do that you can you know create the right application uh a new application be in a space where it doesn't really require this huge amount of manpower that it used to require to to yeah. do that it's it's more like you know, uh, e easy app development, like on, on the app store, but, but it's an interesting place to be in. And so if it, if it were me is just a, you know, one person looking to get into the space, I would be looking at that, that part where you're looking for that application. Now, now the cost does come in on, 
finding the compute power to develop your application because that is kind of expensive. But that, that's the part I would be focused on. I mean, I've seen a lot of people write about and articles about, you know, you're you, eventually you're going to see the first, you know, $1 billion one person company because of AI. Right. right? right. And so it's, it's a unique time to be an entrepreneur and to be, a, you know, a founder of a tech company because it's just, you know, the skill set has changed. And and when there's change in an industry and, and something new, that's when people can, you know, come into the industry. There's it's still wide open. Um yeah. and so so that would be, you know, kind of the uh, my my advice, I guess, would, yeah. would as, as I would say. Yeah, huge opportunity anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um and we're almost done with uh, our conversation, but um I just thought we would uh, jump into some more lighter personal questions to give sure. our audience a glimpse into the person behind uh, uh, Applied Digital. So um, throughout your career in technology investments, there must have been some moments or people that particularly inspired you. Could you share one such source of inspiration and how it influenced your approach to leadership and innovation at Applied Digital? Yeah, so I've, I've, I've had several of those that were, were mm -hmm. big. You know, I call called mentors and people that I you know looked up to is is very it's always very nice through a career to have someone that takes the time to you know explain things to you or show you or or you know do things by example. So I've had many of those. I would hate to to single out just one. Yeah, that's true. Um, but but it it is really helpful to have that. And I've had those people from uh, my first internship in college um, uh, to. Uh, you know, one of my first jobs out, out of school. And I've had that growth, you know, in my career, but it's really been, you know, I've, I've been able to work with some really great people that have kind of, you know, helped me grow up to the, to the person I am. And I, you know, I've, I've had failures for sure. And, I, and you learn a lot from failures in, in through your career. And one of the biggest things I learned and that I, that I really changed as, as we started this company was, you know, knowing what I'm good at and and more importantly, knowing what I'm not good at and then getting people around me that are good at the things that I'm not good at that are important things to have. Uh, and so so that's been a, a real key uh, differentiator for me on, you know, in this venture is is uh, filling in a team of people that that know exactly, you know, that the, the do a great job at the things that I don't do a great job at. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. And when you're not leading the charge at Applied Digital, uh, how do you like to spend your free time? Are there any hobbies or interests that might surprise people when they learn about them? <laughs> so th this is always the one. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I, I have uh, I have eight kids, eight, mm -hmm. and nice. so that's where I spend most of my free time when I'm not yeah. uh, not not uh, running the company. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And in a world increasingly dominated by technology and connectivity, finding ways to disconnect and recharge is just as crucial. So what's your favorite way to un unwind and disconnect from the digital world? Uh, it, well, it's still there. There's um, I'm still connected to the digital world, but, but my, the best way for me to unwind is, uh, is uh, some time away from the uh, kids with my wife. Uh, and oh, we like nice. to spend time uh, and, and if we can catch that a couple of days a week and maybe once on, you know, on the weekend or something, uh, that's really the time that, uh, helps me unwind if it's, you know, a walk or dinner or whatever, but a little quiet time that is just for us that, uh, mm -hmm. and then, uh, and then I, I like to play a certain, uh, frequency of music in the background. You see the speaker behind me that, mm. uh, that is like a, uh, like a, a calming type music that keeps me focused during the day. Okay, so yeah. that's great. Well, wow. It's been an absolute pleasure discussing AI and high-performance computing and with you today. Your your insights not only put a spotlight on the path that Applied Digital is carving in the industry, but also highlight the broader implications of these technologies. So um, as we conclude our conversation, I just want to thank you for sharing your time and your thoughts with us. Uh, your your blend of professional abilities and personal passions are evident and they offer a rich perspective that's both inspiring and thought-provoking. So to our audience, we hope this dialogue um, has sparked some curiosity and encourages you to explore the vast possibilities that AI and high-performance computing hold for our future. And you can learn more about Apply Digital by going to their website, applydigital.com. Wes, thank you once again for joining us and for this uh, fascinating discussion. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.
Yeah, thank you. 